in less than a day, unbearable 38 degrees Celsius heat gave way to snow and frost. You could see a similar scene in a sci-fi movie. But Colorado citizens saw it firsthand in September of 2020 in their own backyards. This abnormally early snowstorm downed power lines and uprooted trees, crashing them onto cars and houses. It also became a prelude to the coldest winter ever recorded in North America, which took hundreds of lives. However, at other times of the year, western states suffer from the worst drought in the last 12 centuries. Similar anomalies occur all around the planet these days. Scientists say their number is only going to grow. Quite soon, the average increase in temperature on Earth will breach the crucial threshold of 1.5 degrees Celsius, which will push humanity towards the scariest catastrophe in the last 450 million years. Will we still have the east coast of the United States, the Netherlands, or Bangladesh? When will Europe be swallowed by one meter thick ice? And most importantly, what will wipe out the global population sooner? Extreme heat or extreme cold? In April of 2023, for some unknown reason, the world ocean heated up more and faster than ever before. The surface water temperature off the North American coast reached almost 14 degrees above average and hit a new high over the last 30-year period. This caused the return of a devastating planetary-scale climate phenomenon, El Nino. Panic-stricken mass media on all continents exploded with news reports. But what is this El Nino anyway, and what makes it so dangerous? Let's see. Under normal conditions, winds blow between the tropics all year round. They come mainly from the northeast in the northern hemisphere and the southeast in the southern hemisphere. They're called trade winds, but sometimes they become weaker when crossing the Pacific Ocean and stop transporting warm water from South America to Southeast Asia. Instead, they move it towards the west coast of the United States. The ocean temperature there abnormal normally increases by around 6 to 10 degrees Celsius, which also makes Earth's atmosphere heat up. Consequently, it creates a domino effect leading to global weather changes, powerful natural cataclysms, and mass die-offs of marine animals. Millions of people are doomed to starve, and thousands may die. This is the true face of El Nino. Experts believe it's been periodically reoccurring for at least the past millennium. But if this event used to swing back and forth every five or seven years and last for 18 months, now, because of rising temperatures, it shows up way more often and has a much more profound effect. Even though each El Nino is unique, its consequences aren't always the same. Some regions literally dry out and catch fire, while others are swamped or ravaged by hurricanes. In 1997 and 98, a mighty El Nino triggered floods and storms that caused more than $5 trillion worth of damage. During those years, Indonesia experienced one of the most severe droughts in known history. And extreme rainfall in northeast Kenya and southern Somalia led to a deadly outbreak of Rift Valley fever. Back then, the El Nino impact claimed the lives of around 23,000 people. The strongest El Nino event on record made 2016 the hottest year in the history of observations. It nearly burned the Canadian area of Fort McMurray to the ground. At some point, a wildfire swept through the community and spread over a territory of almost 600,000 hectares. The blaze continued to smolder for over a year and was fully extinguished only in August of 2017. Because of this, nearly 90,000 people were forced from their homes. That became the biggest wildfire evacuation in Canadian history. The tragedy took two lives. In the meantime, in Phoenix, the capital of Arizona, the heat didn't even need raging fires to kill a record number of locals, 150 people. And even this doesn't seem so shocking once you learn what India had to go through. 
in 2016, in one of its cities, the temperature reached 51 degrees Celsius, causing ferocious drought and a massive freshwater crisis that affected 330 million people. According to some sources, over 1,000 Indians didn't survive this living hell. A human body is simply not meant to withstand such abnormal conditions. As soon as the temperature inches towards 30 degrees Celsius, heat stress may impact the sodium-potassium ratio, reduce metabolic rates, and cause kidney diseases. At 40 degrees Celsius, the body starts suffering from heat exhaustion and then simply blacks out. It's scary to imagine what much higher temperatures could do to you, and they already seem to be taking over the planet. The most extreme maximum temperature on Earth was recorded in 1913 in Death Valley. This is the hottest place on the globe, where the mercury climbed to almost 57 degrees. Although under the influence of a fierce El Nino, in July of 2016, the heat spiked to unprecedented temperatures even outside of Death Valley. In Kuwait, thermometers showed an unbelievable 54 degrees Celsius, while in Iraq, the record high was only one-tenth of a degree behind. Even though the all-time hottest days have stayed in 2016, the average temperature on Earth keeps gradually increasing. This provokes new horrific catastrophes and natural cataclysms. And starting in 2023, the situation may rapidly worsen. According to experts, a super El Nino is currently forming under the ocean's surface, and its potential impact on the planet will be disastrous. Could it trigger a countdown to the end of the world, though? Recent calculations by scientists give a clear warning. If we don't find a way to stop the rise in global temperature, by the end of this decade, we'll face twice as many hurricanes, storms, wildfires, and droughts, and their intensity will also double. Moreover, if we cross the red line by letting the planet become 1.5 degrees hotter, we'll push it into an irreversible climate disaster. If we trust scientists, our chances of avoiding it are only 0.1%. In comparison, all the previously mentioned cataclysms caused by global warming happened when the temperature rose by 1.28 degrees at most. Any further increase will lead to climate changes we'll never be able to tackle. And if some forecasts give us hope that humans will be able to survive on the hostile planet for many years to come, others predict that all living things will die very quickly. The first thing that's usually mentioned in the context of atmospheric heating is glacial melting. As of today, its rate is already unprecedented. On August the 1st, 2019, Greenland lost 11 billion tons of ice in just one day. This amount of water could be enough to fill 4,400,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools. That was the largest single-day volume loss on record. The Greenland ice sheet is at least 3 kilometers thick, and if this entire structure melts, the total water mass would be 115 times larger than that of the Great Lakes. If this really happens, the sea level will rise by 7 meters all over the globe. In this case, not only coastal regions will be swamped, almost half of the world's population lives in cities more or less vulnerable to rising sea levels. But in truth, most scientists agree that Miami and Bangladesh will anyway disappear underwater within a century. As a matter of fact, 15 million people are at constant risk of dealing with a sudden flood. Most of them live far away from a coastline near high mountains in India, Pakistan, Nepal, and China. Some glaciers melt at the mountain tops, creating huge and deep lakes. When they get too swollen by the water inflow, it'll result in an outburst of flood. This torrent will flow down at a breakneck speed of around 120 kilometers an hour, destroying everything in its way. This could become a reality at any moment and involve any of these mountain lakes. But if all glaciers on Earth melt anyway, 
the damage will be truly apocalyptic. The global sea level will rise by around 65 meters. The water will completely submerge the Netherlands, and many European cities will disappear forever. There will be no U.S. Atlantic coast in some areas of California anymore. Washington, New York City, New Orleans, San Francisco, and Los Angeles will be partly or entirely wiped off the map. The flooding will engulf the largest South American cities, Buenos Aires, Lima, and Rio de Janeiro. As for Asia, the water will consume territories that are currently home to around 600 million people. And there will be an entire new sea that will appear in the middle of Australia. The least damaged dry land will be the territories of Africa, since most part of this continent is located at least 200 meters above sea level. However, the global temperature spike will make living there impossible. And even if the sea level rises by just a few meters, a large number of freshwater sources will be contaminated while farmlands will be swamped. Dozens of millions of climate refugees will have to look for other places to settle in. Without exaggeration, humans will have to fight for food and drinkable water. But maybe we won't have to die so agonizingly slowly. Perhaps we'll all cease to exist much sooner from a methane bomb explosion. The so-called clathrate gun hypothesis says there's a 50 gigaton delay action methane bomb buried on the ocean floor, which could presumably detonate at any moment. If it does, humanity will go extinct in mere weeks. But in fact, it's not going to be a classic explosion with a shockwave and blinding flames. There exists a large reservoir of methane clathrate on the sea bottom in the permafrost. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas that's around 34 times more effective at trapping heat than carbon dioxide. If glaciers melt and the world ocean warms up, these deposits may be released. Some scientists believe that methane clathrate was the exact reason behind the biggest mass extinction on Earth of all time that happened 250 million years ago. Back then, the planet's temperature rose by 10 degrees, which killed 90% of all existing species. Right now, climatologists already see red flags that better not be ignored. For example, in the winter of 2020 and 2021, the northernmost Asian peninsula called Tamir had to cope with an unprecedented heat wave that led to significant methane emissions from the permafrost. Then in January of 2023 in Antarctica, a massive iceberg broke away from the ice shelf. It measured more than 1,500 square kilometers, or approximately two New York cities. We were lucky there was no methane deposit under that particular ice chunk. But next time, we may not be so fortunate, and the methane bomb may finally go off. And mind you, there are no antidotes or means of protection against it. If large amounts of methane clathrate escape the permafrost simultaneously, there's no hope for us. But actually, everything may unfold in exactly the opposite way. El Nino isn't the only climate pattern on our planet. It has an evil twin sister, La Nina. Everything it does is like a mirror reflection. Trade winds strengthen even more than usual, pushing warm water too far away and cooling it down way too much. Over the past three years, the Pacific Ocean was affected by nothing else but La Nina. The fact that this weather pattern persists for several years in a row is quite remarkable. It's a very rare phenomenon that's occurred only twice in known history. But if the ocean is getting colder, does that cancel global warming, meaning we're gonna freeze? In fact, both La Nina and her brother entailed different cataclysms whose force and brutality have broken all records over recent years. The continent that La Nina hit especially hard was Australia. At first, during the Black Summer, awful bushfires burned across an area of at least 243,000 square kilometers, which is approximately twice the size of England. After that, 
Australia faced the worst deluge in the last 60 years. In the spring of 2022, Queensland and New South Wales received more than a year's worth of rain in just a week. By the end of autumn, downpours slammed dozens of populous places, including Sydney, setting the city's new rainfall record more than two and a half meters. At the same time, Europe was surviving the worst drought of the past 500 years of its history. Many tons of dead fish were rotting on the banks of dried up navigable rivers, contaminating the remaining water with ptomaine and filling the air with an awful stench. And while governments of the EU countries simply imposed bans on watering lawns and washing cars due to a water shortage, some other states couldn't put out large-scale fires because of it. By late July, the blaze had already burned more than 515 hectares of European land, while at least 24,000 people died from the abnormal heat and its consequences. The triple dip La Nina is also responsible for the deadliest hurricane in Florida since 1935, Ian. It came with torrential rains that were followed by widespread flooding. At the same point in time, a similar story happened in Canada that was hit by the most intense cyclone in the country's history, Fiona. In Pakistan, the monsoon season produced devastating floods, killing more than 1,700 locals. Apart from pictures of hellish droughts and wildfires, La Nina brought apocalyptic cold. On February the 3rd, 2023, at the summit of Mount Washington, a sudden windstorm blew, dusting up to 205 kilometers per hour. Furthermore, the temperature of those winds dropped to dangerously low levels of minus 78 degrees Celsius. This is an absolute record in the entire history of the U.S. Because of the hurricane force outbreak, in less than 24 hours, in Boston and the state of Maine, the mercury plunged from plus 10 to the coldest temperature of the last 60 years, minus 23 degrees Celsius. Such a sharp change in weather led to frost quakes, seismic events occurring because liquid water in the ground freezes solid and expands quickly. But that's not all. For several winters in a row, citizens of the U.S. and Canada have been found frozen to death. Even modern-day equipment and electronics cannot always withstand the effects of violent storms and extreme temperatures. Hundreds of thousands of people wind up in completely paralyzed cities without electricity. Every single time, these winter storms ruin hundreds of lives. This nightmare may become a daily reality for the whole global population if, don't be surprised, Greenland's glaciers continue melting. Their fresh water gets mixed with the salty water of one of the world's strongest ocean currents, the Gulf Stream. As a result, it gradually slows down and its flow is now the weakest in the last 1,600 years. If the stream stops altogether, Europe and North America will experience a sudden and catastrophic temperature drop like in the disaster movie The Day After Tomorrow, except that it won't happen so fast and abruptly. Besides, something similar already took place a long time ago. Around 1300, for some inexplicable reason, the pace of the Gulf Stream slowed, and within a decade, Europe's little ice age began. Because of four gloomy and rainy summers and incredibly harsh winters, crops died for several years in a row, while orchards and vineyards froze over in England, Scotland, France, and Germany. This caused widespread famine on the continent. It gradually ended only 60 years later, and it took the air more than a century to start getting relatively warmer. There's a high chance a new ice age is patiently waiting for us, but we can't blame the Gulf Stream alone, as the sun is also a big deal here. Astrophysicists remind us that the last period of extremely low solar activity sparked yet another ice age when the River Thames was covered with almost 30 meter thick ice. In 2020, the sun started a new solar cycle, and nobody knows what it may entail this time. At the same time, geologists even claim that for Earth, ice ages are like the change of day and night. 
Around 10,000 years ago, our planet's temperature soared to a maximum level since the last glacial period. Right now, it's heading towards the next one. Earth's global temperature was indeed dropping little by little until humans and their technological progress interfered. However, it'll hardly make any difference on a world scale, and eventually, humanity will disappear because of the same catastrophe that eliminated most life forms 450 million years ago. During the Ordovician Silurian extinction that occurred as a result of global cooling, about 85% of all species died out. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned the Permian-Triassic extinction event that was triggered by rising global temperatures, and now there's extreme cold rearing its head. It's high time to wonder, what will put an end to human history? Fire or ice? And one more thing, are we even focused on the right problem? Earth is highly similar to a human organism because both things are very well organized. But if even the smallest cog fails to function, the entire system becomes vulnerable. That's why extreme weather events are a significant challenge to our planet. It may take just one and a half extra degrees to lose control of the situation and watch the world fall apart. If we analyze these changes more carefully, though, we'll see that both rising temperatures and ice ages mainly impact the state of the world ocean that, so to say, air conditions our whole planet. Which is why the effects of El Nino or La Nina are so evident. But we've got to dig deeper to see what really caused the largest mass extinctions in the history of Earth and what could kill off humankind in the not-too-distant future. The answer is simple. No breathable air. A lack of oxygen is the main factor behind the mass mortality of fish in warmer years. It's not hot. It just suffocates. In truth, atmospheric oxygen levels varied from the lowest 10% to the highest 35% over the last 540 million years. Currently, this level has steadied at approximately 21%. But what about the ocean? Actually, that's a pretty closed system, and yet, water bodies are the natural habitat of cyanobacteria, also known as blue-green algae, that injected the atmosphere with oxygen 2.5 billion years ago. We should also appreciate them for absorbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and saturating water with dissolved oxygen. Sadly, both drastic increases and drops in global temperature provoke chain reactions that make oxygen levels in the world ocean fall. It's easy to guess what happens next. Precious cyanobacteria begin to die. These microorganisms make up 90% of living matter in our biosphere. Now imagine them dying from suffocation. The ocean no longer has a source of oxygen. A large share of phytoplankton slowly dies and decomposes. The decay process leads to further oxygen depletion in the water, while carbon dioxide concentration increases. This causes the mass extinction of marine organisms. In addition, since plankton is the basis of all aquatic food webs, all creatures that used to feed on it now have nothing to eat and starve to death. Therefore, the entire food chain collapses. The death of the ocean alone will bring humans serious problems. A lot of regions will face severe famine and economic crises. If we lose cyanobacteria in the ocean, environmental damage will be irreversible. Atmospheric oxygen levels will start decreasing. When they go down to 17%, very few people living in extensive, dirty metropolitan areas will feel the difference. At worst, their night vision will become poor since it's one of the earliest symptoms of hypoxia. I'll tell you more, when the oxygen level hits 15%, people won't die either. However, they'll find it much harder to do any physical work. We'll all suffer from chronic headaches, dizziness, and visual impairment. Did you ever notice that on scorching hot days, people get tired and sleepy and think very slowly? This is exactly how humankind will be like at the first signs of oxygen deprivation. What happens on our planet next, we won't be able to stop. 
When there's less than 14% oxygen, society will no longer function. Our heart and respiratory rates will exceed the critical threshold. Fatigue will become unbearable, and muscles won't react to the brain's commands. This is a condition that many alpinists experience in the so-called death zone, meaning an altitude of more than 8,000 meters. In the best case scenario, the further decrease of oxygen will lead to strokes and humans will quickly die. Alternatives are rather dismal. For example, dying from pulmonary edema when you can't stop coughing up foamy fluids or resist horrible choking sensations. Sometimes the cough can get so bad that it induces rib fracture. In the meantime, other people will deal with brain swelling, intense nausea, vomiting, and psychosis. If the oxygen level goes any lower, say to 6%, death would come in a matter of minutes. But don't worry, none of us is gonna last out till that point anyway. And let's hope we're too weak to survive till the worldwide climate apocalypse. A bit earlier, we wondered what would kill us faster. But imagine that bitter cold and hellish heat are ripping the planet apart simultaneously. North America and Europe will first burn to ashes and then become ice deserts. Africa will disappear under snowdrifts and the rest of Earth will dry up and then be flooded. The only safe place able to give shelter will be mountaintops in Chile, or now blossoming Antarctica and Tierra del Fuego. Considering climate trends and human activities, which of the apocalyptic scenarios is more likely to come true, in your opinion?